Great. I think we're going to have some interactive uh, questions. I put in three cases. I didn't know what the audience would be like. Maybe I'll try to go fast through the second one, but the first one sort of fits your patient that you just described. Um, and what Jonathan was saying, in the BRIGHT study, we had 15 patients that were on both Fostemsevir and also Ibiluzumab. The FDA allowed two investigational agents to be put together. And it, it was, so again, that was my thing. So the first case is it's a 52-year-old uh, white male, heavily treatment experience, multiple prior ARVs. Uh, he had active thrush, presumed candida esophagitis. He was initially on itraconazole and nystatin, and he was switched to IV amphotericin B. He had VZV of his palate and AVN of his hip. Interestingly, on ART is Varlo's 22,000. Off ART, it's 557,000. His current regimen is Darunavir and uh, with Elvitegavir, Cobacistat, Tenofovir, and FTC at that time. So they were using the Cobacistat to boost both the Darunavir and the Elvitegavir. So this is the combined genotype and phenotype. And I have to, this is a point. I put this case in because I knew I'd have the panel here, and I want to see what they want uh, to do with this patient and also to help uh, uh, educate me on what their thoughts are. So interesting, essentially the patient was re uh, resistant to everything except integrase inhibitors, which he was totally sensitive to all of them. So that tells you something about what could be possibly happening with this patient given that he was on l uh, But he refused T20. He said he would not use T20. So if you go through our little step-by-step -step pro process, we talked to him about adherence, and he admitted it was really hard to take pills, and it's not surprising because he had candida esophagitis, and he also, he was a survivor. He had been infected for almost 20 years, and so he was just used to going on and off his meds when he wasn't feeling very well. The drug-drug interactions, I'll show you there, who thinks itraconazole would be interacting with the ART? So viral load and CD4 count trends over time. He has a CD4 count less than 50 for years, and now his CD4 count is two. And then the cumulative genotype we talked about. So this is doing the assessment for DDIs, drug-drug interaction. Actually, itraconazole increases protease inhibitors, increases uh, uh, L-vitagravir, and, uh, and, and they can also have an effect on itraconazole. So you couldn't blame it on necessarily that this was chewing up the drugs, but it was probably adherence uh, for, for this patient. Again, so this is the mutations. Uh, this is for the panel. Uh, essentially, he has high-level resistance to everything and the protease inhibitors. I didn't show the integrase inhibitors because he's pan-susceptible. And again, he's dual-mixed meaning he has CC, uh, CXCR4 virus and CCR5 tropic virus present. Uh, and he was all uh, sensitive to integrases. So here's your question. Wilco, are you going to put up a, a thing? So these are the questions. You can answer it on your phone if you uh, want to go to that. What would you do with this patient? Remember, on therapy, he has a viral load of 22,000. And he's pan-resistant to everything but integrase inhibitors. And he's essentially on monotherapy with uh, elvitegravir. So what regimen would you choose? Continue ART, the same one that he's on. Uh, Darunavir uh, boosted BID with dolutegravir once a day, because there was no integrase resistance. Same regimen, but with dolutegravir B BID, trying to get extra potency. And etravirine, even though he was resistant to etravirine. Stop all ARVs and wait until two new agents can be used and refer to a clinical trial of an investigational agent. And there's one question. If you get this, I have to do the whole first talk over again so nobody <laughs> get that one. Mm -hmm. So next. Let's see. see the voting? Good. I don't see it. Uh, great. I don't have to do that talk over again. Um, so it looks like... Okay, Darunavir, Dolutegravir, and Etravirine referred to a clinical trial, and then about 11% Darunavir, Dolutegravir, uh, and uh, 
Tanafa Ver FTC. Did the panel want to say what they would do? Well, I think it's a great question. I think it highlights, as you said, Mike, what we don't do. Yes. So a patient with two CD4 counts, we don't stop. You don't I think stop that's there. an important uh, take home message. And I guess yeah. also the regimen of patients on for a number of reasons is not a good idea. First of all, it's, we're not properly boosting the darunavir. And we're giving L Vitegravir with a patient with 22,000 copies. We know what's going to happen there. So I think both those points are made very well. And then I guess for the others, th what we'd like to do is we'd like to get both the dilutegravir and an investigational agent. And the question is how we do it. We could have an interesting conversation on a travering in this patient. How much we actually benefit from a patient with so much resistance and a travering you pay a, a price as it's an inducer and it reduces the level of the other drugs. Then you can make a case that it might not be worthwhile in this patient with so much resistance. You saw all those NRTI mutations. Your score on the Stanford database would be very high. I think probably not worthwhile. So what we'd like to do is to be able to get this patient. The two most important drugs would be the dilutegravir and an investigational agent. I think darunavir, we would want to get on board appropriately, although we should mention that score is going to be very high. I don't, know, we act, I don't think you actually showed the score, but we have 32 and 47 and 54 M. Yeah. So we give it, but we should be aware that it's not going to give us enough. So it's, it's yeah. a great case because it's highlighted. I don't know if the others have a comment. Um, I completely agree with you, Jonathan. I, I think that, um, first of all, this is somebody in whom you absolutely want to continue therapy because uh, some viral suppression is going to be better than none, and, and uh, 22,000 is a whole lot better than 500,000. Um, uh, secondly, I, I think, um, the, especially with the NNRTI mutations that were present, there probably is uh, not going to the optimal activity of etravirine, and therefore, given the existing darunavir resistance, um, you, you'd worry about this uh, regimen. If you could not access an investigational at all, uh, then I would use the uh, boosted darunavir, dolutegravir, etravirine regimen and hope for the best. Um, but uh, ideally, you would uh, be able to get uh, some new agent on board. Yeah, and so just to summarize that, remember, the, if you can't get them on a two, uh, agents that they have uh, aren't resistant to, you construct a regimen the patient can tolerate and you try to uh, stabilize CD4 cell counts and get the viral load as low as you possibly can and just hopefully uh, maintain uh, them in that situation. And I think that regimen possibly could do. So this is what we did with the patient. I don't know if you can switch back real quick. Well. So he actually was, how I came in contact with this patient, he was referred down to me for the clinical trial. Yeah. and. Uh, and we put him on fostemzivir, dolutegravir, so two new drugs, and, but he would only take darunavir once a day. I probably would have given it twice a day, but he would only uh, take that. And this is what happened to this patient, very interesting, and this is what I was hoping to get the panel. So here's his CD, I mean, excuse me, his viral load, 557,000. He starts on therapy, goes down, but it has never gone to non-detectable. But it, you see it stays very low. It's now at 364, and a CD4 count has gone steadily up to 197. He developed PML right after initiation of virus. He probably was harboring this after, uh, underneath. But amazingly, he's gotten better as the CD4 count has risen. So it's really a, 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 a very nice success. But so this patient, after three years, has had a detectable viral load, and CD4 count continues to rise on this regimen. So what's happening? And this, again, I apologize. You won't be able to read this, probably. But again, this is for the panel. This is what happened to his, uh, this is a phenotype and a genotype combined. And he's now susceptible to everything. Even though his viral load is, uh, this was done at week 36 when his viral load was 4,800 copies. So he's still trending down as CD4 counts going up, but he became hyper susceptible to NNRTIs, integrases, and PIs. Thoughts from the panel? <laughs> So uh, you need to send uh, blood from this person to Jonathan Lee in my group because I'm pretty convinced that what's going on here is this guy has a persistent clone, an expanded clone of, of uh, wild type 
provirus that's probably archived from long ago. Uh, and uh, this clone is, uh, in the presence of these drugs, the virus isn't replicating, but this clone is just spitting out virus. The virus doesn't infect new cells because of the presence of all the, the effective drugs that are uh, on board, but uh, shutting down the clone is something that these drugs are not going to do, and the, the clone is eventually going to peter out, and, and that's why he's got this gradually diminishing virus load uh, and this increasing CD4. That's an entirely hypothetical explanation, but I've now seen enough <laughs> patients like this to be pretty convinced that this yeah. is uh, what may be going on. So and then he started with such a high virus yeah, load that's that that's why he uh, is, is yeah. taking this. I don't know if Charles has uh, some thoughts. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I agree with you. <clears throat> you know, I've had patients like this as well that you just get them on a regimen and, and watch it go down, but it takes a long time because it is so high. But it would be great to really investigate that because in a, in a, in a patient that has a viral load that low, the, I think the utility of, of genotyping and phenotyping is going to be questionable as to what you're really picking up. And it's going to be a very probably single clone type of virus that you're looking at here because you've shut down replication so well in other other area. So Dan, do you want to comment on false temps of you think it might be blocking the virus from entering the cell? Or what do you think might be happening? Uh, uh, well, I, I'm certain that Fostemzivir is blocking uh, uh, the virus from entering the Can cells. Can you remind people what the mechanism of that yeah, is? Yeah, so remember that Fostemzivir binds to GP120 and uh, that, therefore it prevents the uh, viral envelope from interacting with CD4, so the virus can't attach to the CD4 cells. Uh, um, but uh, given the susceptibilities that you showed us, I think there are really three different mechanisms of action uh, uh, that are at play here. First, the virus can't get in. Any viruses that happen to sneak past uh, uh, Fostemzivir are going to get stopped from integrating by the uh, dolutegravir and any viruses that somehow manage to get in and integrate are going to be defective when they're finally produced because the darunavir uh, to which the virus now seems to be susceptible is going to be uh, inhibiting protease. Right. So um, there's no opportunity for rounds of replication, which is what we differentiate from why, or why I differentiate virus production uh, from virus replication. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, the fostemzivir ought to be Great. preventing any Great. viral entry. Charles, did you want to say something? Or? No, no, I agree with okay. Dan. It would okay. be very interesting to confirm this in a, in a number of patients because it helps clinical practice mm -hmm. if we if yeah. he's able to elucidate the mechanism. Yeah, yeah, we're 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 seeing a number of patients like this on the trial, and so I, we're in, very interested in studying these patients. So the next one, I don't have a question for, but I just really wanted to drive this home. So this is a a, a black woman in her 20s. She developed fever, rash, abdominal pain, and after a week she was admitted to the hospital. She was diagnosed with a uh, hemorrhagic cyst, and uh, she's married to a woman, but they introduced male partners into their relationship, and she, ha she was HIV negative. Uh, she had an HIV screening test done. Her antibodies were negative, well, for one and two, but her antigen was positive. And so she had three partners, one minus two months, one minus three weeks, and one minus three days to the time of her diagnosis. Anybody want to guess who is the partner that infected her? So this is a, the CDC uh, laboratory marker appearance. And remember, the new fourth generation assays can get down to about 14 days after infection. And so our patient's actually in the, that area right there because she's P24 antigen positive, but she's antibody negative. And so she had a viral load done. Her viral load was 4 million copies. She's very infectious at this time. Uh, she has a high viral load and she doesn't know she's infected. And so our patient actually has a K1, we sequenced her virus uh, uh, when she uh, came in the clinic. She has a K103M mutation, which confers resistance to classic drugs like efavirenz and nevirapine. Uh, and she had a 41L and a 215L in the reverse transcriptase gene, which can confer partial resistance to NRTIs, and they can, the panel can tell you what 215L means for this patient. So she actually, unfortunately, also was a case of secondary transmission. She was infected with a resistant strain, and then she infected the patient uh, at day minus three because she didn't know she was infected and she had uh, sex with that partner. And again, integrases are low. So what would you put her on? She's resistant to NRT, NNRTIs, and she uh, has uh, a 41L and 215L, 
And if you remember, I can't call it back up, but uh, I showed you her resistance genotype in the first talk. So she would be susceptible to uh, abacavir and also 3TC, FTC, but is that really because we, it, the virus has decreased replication capacity and you aren't going to see a 184V? So she was, so I just wanted to drive home that the 215L is a revertant mutant, and it suggests that our patient B probably wasn't on therapy when he transmitted uh, to this new patient. And so we don't know if he transmitted other resistance mutations uh, to the patient as well. So she was actually put on dolutegavir, abacavir, and 3TC. She was HLA B5701 negative, and her pregnancy test was negative. Viral load goes from 40 uh, 4 million down to 40 copies very robustly within about 16 weeks. But then after six months, she wonders about getting pregnant, and all the news about dolutegavir hit. So she was changed to boosted darunavir. And those of you that aren't familiar with the data, about, if all you heard about dolutegavir and possible uh, association with neural tube defects, so initially the signal was about 0.9% uh, uh, in the Botswana study where they don't do folate supplementation, but now it's drifted down to about 0.3%, so we really don't know if this is a real signal or not, but right now our guidelines recommend that don't use dolutegavir in a woman that's trying to get pregnant or within the first uh, 28 days after uh, 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 pregnancy. But the WHO went ahead with the rollout and recommends using dolutegavir in all patients. And then there was a really nice editorial in the New England Journal two, week, two or three weeks ago from Bob Redfield and the National Center for Birth Defects really supporting the WHO's rollout of dolutegavir in this patient population. And the reason why is uh, uh, this is a very robust regimen. Again, this is a New England Journal paper from a month ago showing dolutegavir plus tenofovir and FTC actually it was a very good first line agent. So I just wanted to emphasize, here's a woman, this is what we deal with, complex patients. You know, she comes in, she has resistance, she gets placed on ther a really robust therapy, but then she wants to get pregnant and we have to uh, adjust on the fly and do that, do that. So some people might say, should we have done a proviral DNA test and, uh, and others, or try to get the partner in and test him? Uh, but unfortunately, the partner uh, was being seen at another clinic and didn't want to come in to us. But. So one last case, and I'll do this one quickly. So this is a 61-year-old uh, African-American woman. She's heavily treatment experienced, three prior regimens. She has hypertension, she has CKD. So her creatinine is about 1.5. Uh, to 1.6, so her GFRs bounce around 50, 45 to 50, estimated GFR. Her viral load is also in the 500,000, and she was referred to us on a Bacavir 3TC and a Favarance. This was a non-HIV provider. She was at a federally qualified health clinic. She didn't know what to do with the patient, and so she sent her to us. And this is her combined genome and phenome results. She's dual mixed, intermediate to darunavir, High level resistance to NRTIs, NNRTIs. Again, the integrases are all sensitive, and she refused T20. And I think we have a, uh, Wilco, I think we have a, oh, first, here's the mutations for the panel. And she actually has a, even a higher uh, level resistance to everything, except Tanafir is ruled out as intermediate, but the combined, when you put in, this is from the genotype, but when you combine the phenotype, it's really resistant to tenofovir as well. Um, so which regimen would you choose for her? Continue current regimen, darunavir plus dolutegavir plus tenofovir and FTC, darunavir plus dolutegavir, BID with etravirine, stop all ARVs, or refer to a clinical trial. Great. Uh, the majority chose darunavir, uh, dolutegavir, and etravirine. Um, this might uh, not be the most optimal because she was fully resistant to etravirine and she was intermediate to darunavir. Uh, but that wouldn't be a necessarily a bad regimen to maintain them on until you got access to new, new agents. 
Um, and this also, same, same with this regimen, the regimen B also could fit that. So the, in the art of medicine, those two regimens possibly could be used in this patient, but you'd have to watch them closely on that. But uh, we had the luxury of referring this patient to a, whoop, to a clinical trial. Uh, again, she was put on falstanzavir, dolutegravir, darunavir, BID, and tenofovir, and FTC. We used TAF because her creatinine clearance was uh, around 50, uh, and she had a robust response. And there's no other th about this. She just has this continued CD4 cell rise, and, and, it, and it just really shows you. And why I wanted to show you those two cases is that when you have two agents where a patient is the, their virus is totally susceptible to, you can get very robust responses. But I'll stop there and we'll let David talk.